and welcome once again to another class presentation of Humanities 231. I'm your instructor, Dr. Barry Graham. Chapter 2 deals with early Greece from your textbook, Culture and Values, the 8th edition. And as we look at a geographical overview of this on the map, we'll note that this is that area of the world that is referred to many times as the Aegean Civilization, taking its name from the Aegean Sea. From our last chapter, you'll remember that these are the peoples that are the ancestors of these ancient Greeks. Uh, they originated around this area here called the Kyklades, so-called because of this circular uh, pattern, basically circular, of islands. It included the island of Delos here, which was the home of a very famous uh, oracle, uh, oracle of the gods, said to be a spokesperson for the gods. And so uh, as these people grow up and mature as a people, uh, we're noting that the next area of activity is down here in the far south on the island of Crete, uh, specifically in the city here of Knossos, you'll recall that that's the home of the fabled King Minos. The history of early Greece can be divided up into three basic periods, the Heroic Age, the Age of Colonization, and the Archaic Period. Archaic may seem a little bit redundant, archaic meaning usually old or ancient, and of course we are deal dealing with an ancient civilization here, but nonetheless that's the way the, that period is designated along with the other two. We look here at one of the few remaining uh, original Greek statues, uh, the sculpture of the day, of the chief god Zeus. And the reason we want to look at this here at the very beginning is that, as we've noted in class, the artwork of a people can many times tell us more about those those peoples than any other uh, single thing. And notice the way that Zeus is portrayed here by the very thing that the Greeks treasure, uh, a warrior on the battlefield. We see the carefully defined muscles, uh, the arm outstretched as if he's going to throw a, a javelin or a spear. Of course, we know in the case of Zeus, this could very well be a thunderbolt. But Zeus is betrayed with dig dignity, he's a victorious warrior, and we see the physical strength that's manifest in him there. The first significant writer among the ancient Greeks was Homer during this earliest period, the Her heroic age. And we want to note at this point the significance of the polis here in, uh, in Greece. Uh, the word polis, you may you, you may uh, find familiar. To, to this day, we still refer to a great city as a metropolis. Um, the polis was the, the city, uh, the home. Uh, it, it, among whom in the Greeks, the polis had such significance that if you were separated from the community there, it was thought that your life really didn't have any meaning. And so the idea of community among the Greeks very, very important here. Religion, mythology, and folklore, as we've noted in other earlier cultures, is the bond that keeps these people together. It expresses basic truths about a people. In our own modern day, we have our own mythologies, um, and that's why those types of movies that deal with things like Star Wars and, and comic book uh, characters, those have become our modern day mythology. And we understand that they're not actually real, but they express basic truths about our culture. And then finally, we see all these things manifested in the art and the literature. In these people, in their religion, prayer didn't occupy that important a place. It was art and literature that expressed what they wanted to express about themselves and, by extension, about the gods that they worshipped. The most famous work of this time, uh, two of them, was the Iliad and the Odyssey, of course, by Homer. And in this, it's expressed the Homeric question. 
uh, these deep questions, uh, very, very important questions that we see that every culture uh, asks. Uh, of course, there's an oral tradition, and as we mentioned in the last chapter, these oral traditions were very well-defined skills among these people. Uh, we have the epithets, we have the elaborate similes, and all of the different uh, writing styles that are, that are used here, especially when we talk about epic literature. In, Il in the Iliad, we have the theme of human responsibility. This, of course, is the story of the, the great Trojan War between the inhabitants of, uh, of the ancient Greek lands and the inhabitants of Troy. And in this elaborately spun uh, epic literature, we see these themes of taking human responsibility and humans knowing their place, and especially these themes, as we mentioned earlier, of the idea of honor on the battlefield. We see this further in a work like the Odyssey, when the Trojan War is over and Odysseus is returning home. This is the return of the epic hero. And so as you read through these works in your textbook, keep these major themes in mind because they'll come to the forefront over and over again. When we talk about art and society in ancient Greece, the oldest things that we notice are the painted vases or vases, as sometimes people uh, call them. The proto-geometric period, starting around 1000 BCE, focuses on uh, concentric circles and semicircles. There's all of these elaborate designs that are painted on these vases. Uh, this likewise occurs in the geometric period, starting about a, uh, roughly around 100 years to 200 years later. And we see these linear designs, the meandering lines, things of that nature, and also some of the very earliest human forms circa somewhere around uh, 800 uh, BCE. The largest of these vases are what we call amphoras. They were also used as grave markers uh, during this time. And these are still very popular even today uh, with uh, people who elaborately decorate their homes, these very large vases, and they're still referred to as amphoras. We then proceed into the age of colonization. Uh, we see the prosperity of the Greek city-states. Remember, we talked about the emphasis on the polis and the city-states, such as Athens and Sparta and many of the other cities uh, city-states during this time, uh, are actually very, very competitive. Uh, there's competition. Uh, they're very, very aware of the image that they have and how the city-state defines them as a people. This results in a certain amount of wealth and even overpopulation because people want to live where the money is. And as a result of that, and this was true of, of most uh, ancient cultures, um, colonization. They would send the people out uh, because it was so crowded, but the idea was to take this Greek way of life with you so that this uh, kind of thinking and this type of uh, empire or civilization would spread to other places. And so we see it in uh, diverse places such as Italy and Sicily and Egypt and Asia Minor. Uh, this is a world empire, or at least the known world as they knew it back in that time. And this results in, as we mentioned, wealth, because there's trade, uh, and as they're trading goods, uh, trading the things that they're able to produce, and trading for the things that they're not able to produce, this brings you into contact with other cultures. And so, unlike the Egyptians, who were very settled and very provincial and didn't engage in trade because the Nile River and their other natural resources gave them uh, the things that they needed, in ancient uh, among the ancient Greeks this was very much not the case and so sometimes this is referred to as the oriental uh, orientalizing of the Greek city-states they were being exposed to other cultures and so they were thinking more broadly we see this in the visual arts at 
uh, two of the most important city-states of this time, Corinth and Athens. You might be familiar with Corinth because in the New Testament, Paul has a couple of books written to the Corinthians there. By his time, uh, it didn't have quite the importance that it did in ancient times. But in ancient times, it was right on the trade route. We're talking about Corinth here. And so it, uh, it, it, it was one of the very most important of the city-states among the Greeks. In Corinthian art, we see these eastern motifs that we talked about in terms of the orient, uh, orientalizing of the culture uh, in trading with some of these far-off lands. They're bringing some of these styles into their own art. And so as a result of this, Corinth becomes very commercially successful. As I mentioned, it's right on the trade route there. And so you have diverse people who are coming through. Among Athens, which is more, which over time became the intellectual center of the uh, Greek Empire, uh, in Athenian art we have more of a narrative style, uh, displaying their myths and even scenes from their daily life. And this, in turn, creates a trade rivalry between uh, both Corinth and Athens. And we see this very much among the Greek city-states of this time. Again, this competition, uh, almost uh, like athletic competitions. We would think about athletic competitions today. This will then bring us to the beginnings of Greek sculpture. Uh, we've looked at Zeus earlier, uh, but there are many others. The Near Eastern and Egyptian influences are very obvious and, and far-reaching here. And there are two main artistic conventions or genres that we see at play here. Um, the Kura and the Kuros, the standing male figure and the standing female figure. And there's an increasing sense of realism and naturalism in their sculpture. Uh, much more so than what we saw earlier with the Egyptians and other more ancient empires. This is because uh, in, in among the ancient Greeks, there was this early emphasis on science and, and uh, what we would call the scientific method today in terms of observing things. So as they began their careful study of human anatomy, they're able to put that at work in terms of the way that they uh, sculpt and the way that they display the human body. Uh, there's this very real representation of life and the vigor uh, that goes along with that. Here is a great example from somewhere around 530 BCE of one of the standing female figures, the Cora that we made mention of a while ago. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the Egyptian influence there, both in the way that the hair is, uh, is, is done, uh, the type of dress, uh, very common among ancient peoples, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later. But uh, what back in the 70s, what they called a granny gown uh, goes all the way to the bottom of the, uh, of the feet, and this is one of the conventions, uh, the way that uh, one of the conventions that they borrowed from the Egyptians in terms of the way that they're portraying uh, the female figure. As we proceed forward, we'll also see that there's a particular convention in terms of the way that they portray the male figure. And we see it right here with the Kuros, uh, the Egyptian influ influence there on the head. Uh, should be very obvious. Uh, uh, they've got the dreads, uh, even in, uh, still in style, uh, even today. And I think one of the interesting things in here, in terms of the way that they have copied the Egyptian conventions, is this idea of the left foot forward. Uh, this was said to portray stability, um, and, and you see it in most of these early artworks. Um, students are, are fond of pointing out that the, the females are, are always portrayed with the uh, fully clothed, uh, so why are the males portrayed in this way? Well, what we're going to find out as we go forward is that in many of the competitions, including the Olympic Games that we'll look at later, uh, there was, they always competed in the nude. 
and this was so that they could be accurately judged uh, on their form. Uh, it wasn't necessarily the one who won the race uh, that was awarded uh, the first prize, uh, their equivalent of a first prize, but the one who actually looked the best doing it. And so that's basically the reason why uh, that that sort of thing went on. Now we're seeing, as we go along here, it gets more and more realistic um, the way they're portraying these conventions of the standing female and the standing male. Uh, in this later version that we see uh, of the Kouros, this should be evident. And once again, here's at the bottom, here's the left foot forward. And so we're going to see that uh, in, and this is a marble work, by the way, here. Uh, in terms of the Kouros. That's, uh, that's going to become more and more common as we look at sculpture. Sculpture and painting in the archaic period as we move forward. Um, in the, on the political scene, um, Salon's legal reformations made a big impact here. Uh, and even to this day, uh, one of the nicknames or terms that we use to describe a politician is called a Salon. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term, but it's still quite uh, common out there. And so this individual who is responsible for some of the greatest uh, uh, reformations that we see in ancient times among the uh, the legal uh, aspects and the laws uh, was referred to as his name was Salon. Uh, the tyrants were in power during this time, and they were some of the first ones to patronize the artist. Patronize, of course, means they're the one that are funding these things. Now, bear in mind, during this period of history, tyrant didn't mean the same thing as it would mean today. We're used to thinking that of somebody like a Hitler or a Mussolini, uh, someone who is, uh, is, is an evil uh, individual. A tyrant wasn't necessarily an evil person. This was just their word for king back then, and this is how it originated. But with them there to fund the arts... Uh, we saw much, we see much in the way of artistic development during this archaic period. For instance, the freestanding figures that we'll see examples of later, the high and low relief carvings where they would carve directly into the surface of uh, some of these temples and, and buildings uh, that are common in, in ancient Greece. Also, the use of the archaic smile um, in many of these uh, sculpt sculptures uh, where they have this kind of a wry, uh, understated smile on the face of many of these figures. And then, of course, vase painting continues to be very popular, and they begin using what's called the black and red, red figure styles, uh, especially in the way that they depict uh, people. Shepherds, uh, of course, are common during these uh, ancient times, and seeing the calf bearer here. Again, uh, what's left of it, you can see the decay here at the bottom uh, in which uh, we don't have the full um, sculpture. And, and as I mentioned earlier, most of what we do have are really Roman copies of Greek works. Uh, we don't really have much of what's left of the, uh, of the original Greek works. But again, you can see what we referred to up here on his face as the archaic smile, kind of a coy smile as he gently uh, lifts his uh, livestock there uh, and carries it very, very tenderly. Another Korah here, and I think this is fascinating that we get to see the dress of an ancient Grecian woman. Uh, not just the beautiful hairstyle, but the way that they uh, wore their various uh, outfits here. She's wearing what's called the peplos. The peplos was actually worn by both male and females, and it was a, a garment that started wide at the shoulders, comes in more narrow at the waist, and then flows down uh, to the feet. And this was, uh, like as I mentioned, this was used not only among the, the females, but among the males uh, as well. And so since everyone wore this, this was, uh, this was thought to be the dress of the common woman back during this uh, this day. And so as this is portrayed in this manner, as we go forward, look at this one. This is more the garment of the rich. Uh, 
during this time. You can see the elaborate hairstyle, the elaborate uh, jewelry that she's wearing here. But this garment here is what's interesting. It's called a hemation. And it's a free-flowing mantle that can be arranged creatively in whatever um, in whatever way that the woman might desire. But it's also very, very expensive. And it gives us a unique insight into the New Testament scriptures. And this is why knowing something about the culture uh, that were dominant during the time in which the Bible was written, specifically we're talking about the New Testament here, even though this would predate the New Testament, We'll recall that even when the Romans took power, they preserved much of Greek culture. And so it was still a Hellenistic culture. And that's why um, the Greek language was very common, uh, specifically the, what's called the Koine Greek. And that's why the New Testament was written in that language. But what we see here is it's interesting because when Paul writes to uh, Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10, it's a very um, uh, familiar scripture where Paul instructs Timothy that likewise also women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or, and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Now, you may have, have, have read that before and been, maybe been somewhat puzzled. What does Paul have against um, uh, braided hair and jewelry and those kinds of things? And even, you know, this idea of, of uh, costly uh, attire. What we'll remember that when Christianity first began to spread across the, uh, the Roman Empire, this Greek culture was still very much in place. And for the first time, you had rich people hanging out with poor people that otherwise would have never hung out together, but now they're brothers and sisters within a fellowship within these home churches. They were all home churches at first. There were no church buildings for close to 300 years or so. And so they're meeting together, and what Paul finds is that the rich women are, so to speak, rubbing it in the face of the poor people. They're flaunting their wealth by wearing these hemations and the costly jewelry, and it's really making the the uh, poorer women uh, feel very, very bad. And so all Paul is saying here when he tells them to dress with modesty, he's not talking at all about how much skin they're showing, even though there's, a, there's obviously a, a, a principle of modesty that we could encourage as well. But he's not talking about that. He's just saying rather than wearing these hemations, why not just wear the peplos? so that there can be equality among each other and you don't make these poor women feel badly about their economic uh, lot in life. And so the word Paul uses for modesty here is actually the Greek word cosmios. And you'll notice that that's very similar to our word cosmos that we use to describe the universe uh, that we live in. And what cosmos means is orderly. Women dress in an orderly fashion. And so if we go back here and we look at the peplos, look at the orderliness of it. Once again, there's a symmetry to it. It starts wide at the shoulders, comes down more narrow at the waist, and then flows out wider again and go, flows down to the floor. So modesty is actually cosmios, or cosmos, orderly, uh, and not an emphasis on what we might normally think of as modesty. As we move forward in the history of Greek sculpture, we again we see more and more realism. Here in the Critios boy, we can see how the very, very smooth use of the material of, of the marble uh, in which the uh, the sculpture is made of gives us this definition of the muscles and the tissue and uh, the kinds of things that add to this realism here. And of course you see the supports here at the bottom uh, because much of this over a period of time has broken, uh, but this much at least has been preserved.
In the next slide, we see a great example of red figure technique used in these vases. We talked about the fact that it was black figure technique, red figure technique, and this red figure technique allows much more naturalism. Uh, again, what's depicted is what the Greeks prize, uh, this idea of honor on the battlefield. And so that those kinds of things will occur again and again. We'll now proceed to architecture. Um, there were many types of columns that were used uh, in the construction of these buildings, uh, specifically the temples, uh, that many of which, at least parts of it, still survive amazingly even to this day. And so this not only had a practical use of holding up the, um, uh, the roof structure, the upper structure of the temple, but they made different designs in these uh, uh, columns. And the first in which we want to look at is the Doric order. It had a simple dignity to it. Uh, there was no base to it, and there were basically 20 of these indented flutes within the uh, column itself. And by the way, we, we see these same styles today that are used in um, government buildings. Whenever we want to communicate this dignity, uh, it seems like uh, we, we, we use this in government buildings. We still use them in churches, in some style homes. When they have these columns, they'll, they'll use them as well. Uh, the capital of the structure there was composed of uh, Echinus and uh, Abacus. Uh, and then there was the term uh, that we use, the entabulature, uh, that was composed of the architrave, the frieze, the triglyphs, and the metopes. And you, you may not be familiar with these terms, but in your book there's a really nice illustration where it points out these various uh, parts. Uh, but we do want to underscore uh, these types, uh, types of terms uh, as we give you just a, a brief overview of this. And then finally it concludes with the cornice and the pediment. Uh, all of these various parts of the temple that had to do with the Doric order. As I mentioned, some of these survive even to this day. And we see a nice illustration of it here. The, uh, as you can see, the, 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 the roof uh, ceiling part of the temple is, is missing. But the columns, amazingly, are still there. Very, very strong. And, of course, these are held in high regard. Uh, I can remember as a young man looking at uh, uh, some of the adventure movies, the Hercules-type movies that they would make. And they would actually allow them to film on site uh, around these, uh, these monuments to add to the flavor of the movie. And they no longer allow them to, to do that. Uh, they're afraid of damage uh, to these old structures. And so if you go look at an old movie like the classic 1963 Jason and the Argonauts, uh, you'll note that they're around structures like this, and they allow them to film right there, but they, uh, they wouldn't allow that today. We'll move from the Doric order to the Ionic order. Uh, these are fancier. They're more ornate and fanciful. There's a tiered base with uh, now 24 flutes. Uh, the capital is composed of, of volutes, and there's a 3D uh, architraves, uh, arch architraves uh, that are uh, involved in the building of, of these. And also a running frieze uh, in which there, there's all kinds of detail that's carved into there. And so as you look at these uh, in, the, in the textbook, uh, you'll notice the uh, difference between the uh, Doric and the Ionic order. We now want to proceed to music and dance in early Greece. Um, this is still a mystery to us in some ways, especially in terms of the music, because there's really very little in the way of written music that survives. And even what does survive, we're not really quite sure how to decode it. And obviously there's no recorded music, so we just have to guess in some ways of what the music of this day sounded like. We know the instruments that they used. We don't know exactly what they sounded like and how they had them tuned and you know, things, things of that nature. And so some of this is speculation. What we do know, uh, written by the philosophers of the day, was the doctrine of ethos. Uh, it was their form of, of a basic music theory. Uh, they were they were examining exactly how these tonalities worked in music, and so they 
composed their music in certain types of what we would call today scales. They called them modes. And two of the most common were the Dorian and the Phrygian mode. Uh, if you go to YouTube and uh, search for those, you can find music that's actually composed in those uh, basic scales. And they have very interesting sounds to them. Music of this day, as you can guess, was primarily vocal, even though they did have musical instruments, but it was a lot easier to sing than it was to afford uh, a, uh, an expensive uh, musical instrument. And so in the Paean and the Dithram, um, those are also terms that I would, uh, I would prefer that you be familiar with, uh, especially in terms of the vocal music. Uh, the uh, instrumentation among the instrumental music um, it revolved around the uh, kithara and the alios, the kithara and the alios. There was also a great significance of narratives that was combined with the music because, as you know, music is used many times to tell a story. And uh, in later history, in the Olympic Games, they'll not only have athletic competitions, but they'll have competitions in music and drama something that we probably wouldn't think of uh, today. Uh, we usually put that into other areas like American Idol and uh, competitions like uh, such as that. But music and dance and drama were all uh, involved and integrated in these various uh, types of art. We see it preserved here uh, in this among the ancient Greeks. You can see somebody here playing uh, the uh, kithara very large stringed uh, instrument. It's like a very large, uh, smaller version of this would be called the lyre, which we read about, you know, King David playing in the in the Bible and things of, things of this nature. And looking up at the sky, you know, singing or doing the narration. And so we see the important importance of the music here. With uh, uh, in this is probably somebody involved in the music competition. And uh, these various uh, modes that we mentioned, both the Dorian and the Phrygian, the Dorian was considered much more intellectual, whereas the Phrygian was uh, considered something that appealed more to the base uh, emotions. And so it would be today a, a, a common um, uh, parallel would be between classical music and rock music. And that will bring us to our final slide in this presentation, uh, a brief overview of literature and philosophy among these most early of the ancient Greeks. We really don't know a lot about the literature between the time of Homer and this later period, but the one exception to that uh, is a writer that uh, some of his works did manage to survive, and that was Hesiod. Uh, Hesiod was well known for a couple of his works, uh, The Theogony and Works and Days. Um, the Theogony was, a, was really a very poetic account about the origins of the world, you know, very, very high-minded subject matter. But interestingly, The Works and Days... Well, it was a little bit more down to earth. Uh, talked about the disadvantages of being poor and oppressed, and um, uh, he was he was a farmer in Boeotia, and so he didn't live anything what we would call a affluent life. Uh, quite the opposite, uh, actually. And the climate in that area is not predisposed to to being very kind to the farmers. It was severe. He he said it was severe in the winter, stuffy in the summer and good at no time of year. So obviously not a very optimistic fella. The lyric verse uh, in the uh, verses, the Homeric, uh, heroic rather, the lyric verse versus the ho uh, heroic verse uh, is exemplified in the works of a female writer by the name of uh, Sappho. With Sappho, uh, she actually conducted a school on the island of, of Lesbos for uh, a number of the young women whose uh, husbands and fathers had gone off to war. And yes, the island of Lesbos is where we get the term lesbian, and they do speculate about homosexual relationships uh, because really among the Greeks, uh, that was uh, thought to be not really looked down on uh, among them uh, during that time. Uh, in fact, it was amongst, amongst some of the people uh, 
uh, it was it was it, it could have been even a, a very common thing. But that's really beside the point in terms of just looking at this uh, type of verse, poetic verse, uh, and, and that they used in the competitions and things of, things of that nature. That brings us then to philosophy with the pre-Socratics, so-called because everything before Socrates is basically referred to as the pre-Socratics. And so among them we have a number of the different schools that form the foundation for uh, this very advanced Greek philosophy that was to come along later. Among them, the materialists, uh, the uh, Pythagoreanism, the dualists, and the atomist. And yes, they did uh, propose the idea of these tiny bits of matter that uh, were so small they were unable to be seen, and they referred to them as atoms. Atoms was from a word which means literally unable to be cut. So they were not right about that. You know, we did split the atom, and, and the uh, results of the atomic bombs and the hydrogen bombs are, of course, evidence, strong evidence uh, of that. But they didn't have electron microscopes, and it is interesting that just purely using the power of their minds, uh, they were able to speculate on such things as subatomic uh, matter. And then finally... We conclude with an individual who's called the father of history, uh, Herodotus, one of the first historians. And we shouldn't think of him as an historian in the modern day sense of the word, but he was a very good uh, uh, researcher and was someone who spent a great deal of his life uh, looking at what went on before him. In fact, most of what we know about the ancient Egyptian empires comes from uh, Herodotus uh, because he he traveled there and, and talked to many of the uh, the old priests and they gave him a lot of the uh, in, they gave him a lot of the information uh, at least in terms of what they had regarding uh, ancient Egyptian Egyptian civilization when writing about the Greeks of course he emphasizes right over might and that is to say that uh, when he writes about these great Greek victories eventually over the Persians and uh, when the Greek becomes uh, when the Greeks become a world empire he says well we we defeated them because we had right on our side even though the Persians outnumbered them and they certainly did the reasons why we won is because we we were right and of course we see that even today when people will fight uh, what we call a just war it's usually with the idea there that we're justified in doing this because we have right or we have God uh, on our side. And so that was, um, that was in their thinking even during that time. I appreciate your consideration of this uh, video today. I hope it helps, and we'll see you next time.